the Lord and welcome to the Christ Temple Apostolic Hour. This broadcast is brought to you by the Christ Temple Apostolic Faith Church. We are located at 14 South Ashland Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. Here at Christ Temple, we praise God for his countless blessings. So won't you join us with our anointed sanctuary choir as we offer up worship to the Lord. another opportunity to come in your homes by the way of the radio and the TV. We praise the Lord because he's been good and he's been merciful unto us. This morning we're going to ask Evangelist Sullivan, our National Young Missionary Chairman, if she will come and lead us in our morning hymn. And we're going to ask you in Radio Land to stop what you're doing and sing along with us. And you that's in the audience, stand on up with us and let us praise God for what he's done for us. What can wash away my And they're saying, praise Jehovah. Ever 
and I'm sticking with it, I'm going all the way with the Lord. Hallelujah. 
we say hallelujah. We're going to ask the choir to sing one more song for you. Nobody like Jesus. Nobody. Have you found anybody like him? Can we say hallelujah? Come on.
Pastor Dr. D. Rafer Bell, along with our Associate Pastor, District Elder Warren Horde, and their assistants, Elders Wilson Brigands and Jesse McDowell, are inviting you to visit any of our services. Sunday school begins at 9.45 a.m. and morning worship commences at 12 noon. There are various prayer services taking place here at the temple morning, noon, and night. Bible classes are held on Wednesday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. If you are enjoying this broadcast, we invite you to call us. Our telephone line is area code 312-243-5190 or 91. Now is the time for the word of God. For truly the Bible declares that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. As the congregation stands, we are asking that you receive Dr. Michael E. Ford. He is the pastor of Christ Temple Apostolic Faith Church, Louisville, Kentucky. Today's scripture text will come from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. This morning, Dr. Ford will be bearing the message, Is there a doctor in the house? Let us now greet this great man of God by saying amen. Come on, let's give God worship in here. Come on, let's give God praise in here. Come on, holy nation, lift up the name of Jesus. Honor his name right now. Extol him right now. Come on, give him some praise. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's worship. Y'all don't want me to start thinking in here this morning, do you? Amen. The saints at home don't let, when I start thinking, they know something's going to happen. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus, hey! I, not just one, not, not just three, but all that he's done for me. Touch your neighbor and say, my soul. Uh, it's a personal thing. My soul. Come on, give him a hand clap. Give him a wave offering in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I give honor to Jesus, who is the head of my life, and to the presiding bishop and pastor of this church, my presiding bishop, Bishop Dr. D. Rayford Bell, a great man of God. Give him a great big hand clap today. I love the ministry of Bishop Bell, and I have down through the years. His messages have impacted me and have had a great bearing on my life. I don't say that because I'm here, but my people know that I probably can't get through a week without quoting from Bishop Bell, a Bellism. I'm happy to be in this church today, in Christ's temple. I'm happy to be in Christ's temple today. Amen. Give yourselves a great big round of applause. The word of the Lord is coming to us today from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the 58th chapter. I read a lot of passages of scripture, so just bear with me, just very quickly. Isaiah 58, verse number 1 and verse number 2 says, Cry aloud, 
Spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They asked of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. And then in the book of Jeremiah, the eighth chapter, there in the book of Jeremiah, the eighth chapter, beginning at verse number 18, the word of the Lord says this. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughters of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country is not the Lord in Zion, is not her king in her. Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. For the herd of the daughter of my people am I heard, I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold of me. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? In a New Testament companion scripture, I find myself in the book of Matthew, the fourth chapter. Beginning at verse number one. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. We're in the book of Luke now, the 10th chapter, and verse number 30. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him and of his raiment and wounded him, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him went to him and bound up his wound, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took two pence out, gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would speak to us this morning, the congregation of the righteous. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. In the 20th chapter of the book of John, there's just one passage of scripture there that, direct, that I want to direct your attention to, and that's verse number 11. It says, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And there were two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet. And they say unto her, Woman, why do you weep? And she said unto them, Because I, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned her back, and she saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? And whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener said unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you have lain him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. This morning I am, I am lifting up from, this, from St. Luke, from this St. Lukean text, uh, that passage of scripture that says, and uh, verse number 31, hallelujah, verse number 30 rather, 
And a certain man went down to Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him. This morning I'd like to use for a subject these words, wounded soldiers. And from this Jeremiah text, I take my subtopic. And the Jeremiah text speaks to us very powerfully. It says, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And of course, the subtopic would be, is there a doctor in the house? Yeah. As much as I hate to admit it, the enemy of our soul has wounded many of God's soldiers. Many of the people of God have not died in the battle, but they've died of wounds which have gone untreated. Infection has set up in our spirit and has caused us to hold much bitterness on the inside. Gangrene has set up in our soul, causing us to become callous regarding sin and God's standards of righteousness. And the psalmist speaking to the young man who was swept into the sexual trap of an unscrupulous woman. He did not say that the young man died or was cast down to hell as a result of that activity. He said, for she has cast down many wounded. Can I get a witness, somebody? I know folks who have become so enmeshed in fornication and adultery. Y'all going to help me this morning. Give me a little more volume. They become so enmeshed in fornication and adultery and, 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 and they've never recovered from those wounds. Oh, yes, they got forgiven, but uh, the wounds were so deep that they stayed bound for the rest of their lives. David's cry in Psalms 51 was not a cry for repentance. Uh For he got that when Nathan came to him and said, Thou art the man. David, David, David repented of his sins right at that particular moment. Uh And Nathan went to God for David, and Nathan spoke back to David and said, The Lord has put away your sin also. So it wasn't a matter of being forgiven of sins that we find David in the 54th Psalm. David lost something when he sinned. He didn't just lose uh, because of the sin itself, but that is an anointing that comes on the man of God. There is a position that God places you in. and There is an anointing, and David had lost the anointing of God. There's a lot of folks that said in the congregation they're forgiven, uh, but they're still bound. They, they're forgiven. The sins have been washed away, and God has forgiven them for their sins, but they can't move in God no more. They don't feel God like they used to feel him. They don't feel the presence of God like they used to feel God. And David said, I want this back again. I want this relationship back with God. And so David is crying his his cry for the wounds from the sins to be healed. David says, I want, it's a cry to, for his life to come back. He says he wants the return of the anointing. And there are some folks that don't die because of complications from their wounds. They die because they can't handle the mental anguish of walking through life with the thought of a wound. I know men in, who have lost limbs and come back. And they have gone into a hole of depression and into the abyss of alcoholism and drug addiction because they they just couldn't deal with the the thought of walking through life wounded. I feel the presence of God in this place. And we need to understand this morning that Satan often reserves his strongest test for the people of God when they're wounded. He don't get you when you're strong. He don't get you when you've been praying all the time. In fact, he can't get you when you're praying all the time. But he'll let you slip a few prayer meetings, slip some Bible classes. Bishop been teaching that. He taught that last to the Bible. I don't need that at all. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. I don't need all of that anymore. And so you start slipping some Bible classes. and You start slipping uh, the prayer meetings. And, and you get a little weak. Uh, 
And then when you're wounded, that's when he comes in. Oh, I wish I could have a praying church this morning. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. He reserves his strongest test for you when you're in your wounded state. Soldiers over there in World War II laying up in bed, wounded from, from, from being on the battlefield. And when they were wounded, they would listen uh, to the radio. And there was a woman that would come on her name, Tokyo Rose. Mm -hmm. And she would discourage the troops. Yeah. She would talk to them and, 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 and tell them there wasn't any sense in them uh, believing that they had a life when they went back to the United States. Yeah. When I was in Vietnam, there was a woman called Hanoi, uh, Hannah, I think they called her. And uh, Hanoi, Hannah would, would discourage the troops. You laying up there in bed waiting for a letter to come back uh, from your girlfriend. Yeah. And, and, and she would come on the radio and say, ain't no sense in going home. Jody's got your girl and gone. Yeah. And, and, and she would come on there and discourage the troops. And the, she would come and talk to the, the black troops. And she said, black, black brothers, why are you fighting a white man's war? When you get back to Mississippi, when you get back to Alabama, get back to Georgia, they're just going to lynch you. Why are you fighting the white man's war? Why don't you rise up uh, and, 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 and take up your arms? against the United States. She, they would discourage, she would discourage the folks while they're laying in bed, wounded. Yeah. Tokyo Rose and, Hanana, and Hanoi Hannah never laid a hand on any American troop, but she was more effective than an M1 tank. Yeah. For her wo words affected the morale of the troops and she, and, and when morale is low, you, uh, uh, it takes away the will to fight and when you take away the will to fight you take away hope and when you take away hope you're left with nothing but despair and she struck the troops when they were wounded at their weakest point that's what our churches are filled with today wounded soldiers wounded soldiers some have been wounded by relationships Many of us have, have ended up on the empty side of love. Mm -hmm. We've trusted in a relationship. We've trusted uh, in a relationship, and we found out that that person has, has let us down. And, and, and we promised ourselves, because we've been so hurt in that relationship, that I'll never trust again. Yeah. Uh, and since these tr Christians, they can't trust because of the wounds, they can never have a good relationship. Because you know what? You cannot have a relationship without trust. Yes. And, and, and with all trust is the possibility of betrayal. Right. If, you, if you trust somebody, that means that that person can betray you. Yes. And if you say, I'm not going to trust, you can't have a relationship because you can't get close unless you trust. Yes. It's the same way with God. You can't get close to God unless you begin to trust God. Yes. You can't have a relationship with God unless you begin to trust God. Others have been wounded by, by church folk. Hallelujah to God. They've been wounded uh, by institutions. They've been wounded uh, by organizations. They've been wounded by church folk. Can I get a witness, somebody? Uh, did you not know, my friend, that over an eighth of the United States casualties were wounded by friendly fire? Uh, often in Vietnam, we're in Vietnam, some... A uh, drug smoking uh, radio man would write down the wrong coordinates, and napalm and, and white phosphorus would rain from the sky on American troops. Wounded, wounded. It wasn't not Jesus that said, I was wounded in the house of my friend. Hallelujah. Many of us have been wounded by church folks, folks that we put our trust in. It was you, my brother. Could there have been no other? For I told you the secrets of my heart. And when I found out you lied and my friendship you denied from this whole wide world, I wanted to part. It was you, my friend. We went up to church together. We sit in the Bible class together. I told you the most intimate things of my heart and you betrayed me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wounded, wounded. It's troubling to me. 
It's problematic to me that folks who can speak in tongues for an R cannot speak to each other for five All minutes. Right. That's troubling to me. That's troubling to me. Wounded soldiers in the house of God. In the house they are wounded. Somebody say in the house. And there is a universal cry, although sometimes unspoken, in the souls of these wounded soldiers. Is there a doctor in the house? Somebody who will minister to my wounds. Somebody who will love me back to life. Somebody who will understand my pain. Somebody who can perceive that my smile is deceiving and I'm laughing to keep from crying. Is there a doctor in the house? All right, I said, there might be a smile on my face, but in my lonely room I cry. Oh, yes. The tears of a cloud. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh. Sometimes you see me grinning, but you don't know the folk that's sitting next to you. You don't know what they had to go through just to get the church. And you are so sedated. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Move out of the way. I, I, I want to get over and the person is in pain and you're so corner you can't perceive what's in their spirit because you got your own pain. But you need to understand that just coming to church sometime is a struggle for somebody. You preach it! Now, when people make mistakes, and saints allow themselves to become trapped in the devil's web of deceit and in the devil's web of destruction and distortion and degradation. And I believe that there is hope for those who are wounded by sin. I truly believe that. But it would be too easy to dismiss this message and say, Elder, you must be talking to some, some ranked sinner this morning. You must, uh, uh, you know, pastor must be talking to some fornicator this morning. Uh, some deep sinner this morning. And then you pat yourself on the back for your pharisaical attitude. But you would be wrong, my friend. Because I'm not talking to All just right. the one in those situations. But I want you to know that you don't have to be in sin to be wounded. Right. Hallelujah to God. Just the everyday pressures of trying to live for God can wound you. In fact, God Almighty will wound you. Don't you understand? God says that I am He and there is no other God like me. I kill and I make alive. I wound. There's none like me. I lift up my hands to heaven and I say I live forever. Honey, I want you to understand this morning. Jesus didn't take a wrong turn in the wilderness and find himself in the bad neighborhood of the devil. The Bible says that he was driven of the spirit. Come on, somebody. He was driven of the spirit into the wilderness. And the Bible says he was driven there to confront the powers of darkness. This means that God did it. Touch a neighbor and say, God did it. Come touch a neighbor and say, it's him. Oh, glory to God. Sometimes I, sometimes I think about that. Hallelujah. Yeah, sometimes we want to curse our test and our adversity. But it could be that God is trying to speak to us. <laughs> sometimes when I get home, I think about that sometimes. Sometimes when I get home and knock on the door before we got the automatic garage door open. <laughs> But I would knock on the door, and my wife would be on the other side. She said, who is it? And I'd say, it's me. And I think sometimes when we're in our tests and in our trials and in our adversities, and when we're surrounded by temptation and by a storm, sometimes we're asking, who is it? God's speaking back, it's me. It's me, I'm the one that's doing it. You want to blame the person sitting next to you. You want to blame your, your condition. You want to blame it because you're black and white, because you came from low economic status. But it's none of those things. It's God trying to speak to you. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it was in that wilderness experience. Jesus endured the repeated attacks of the devil. And it left him weakened and it left him wounded. How many have ever been in a wilderness situation? How many in the wilderness right now? <laughs> job was without work for 14 months and somebody said well you should have saved up some money for a rainy day I said I had some money for a rainy day but I got a storm I didn't get just a few little triples I got a storm and when you're in a storm you can't lean on the arm of flesh you got to lean on God time when the, the devil, we, we attribute to him a lot of attributes that he really doesn't have. We treat him like he's omnipresent. That's right. We treat him like he's omniscient. Come on, come on, come on. We treat him like he fills all space, yeah. that he has all power, that he has all knowledge, but he doesn't. And he has to work through the works of the flesh yeah. and through what is already in us. Because sometimes we say, that devil made me do it, but the devil didn't make it, it was already in. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. For every man is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own lust. You got stuff in you that God wants to work out of you. You got stuff in you that you don't even know that's in you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus is in that wilderness. Hallelujah. And, 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 and some of us, uh, the devil, he just sent, he don't have to send on, you know, they got ranks of orders of demonic spirits. They got, they got majors and colonels and general demons. Some of us are so weak, you don't have to send them but private demons to him. It ain't gonna take much for him. No. In fact, don't even send the proud. He's going to send his own self and down to the pit. But Jesus, because of who he was, the devil says, listen, boys, I don't need the joint chiefs or staff for this. You boys got a lot of power, but I don't need you. I'm going to go down and do this myself. Jesus, and Jesus is there in the wilderness, and the devil comes down there and, 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 and tempts him and tempts and tries and, and beats him and batters him. And Jesus is left there coming out of his test. He passed all of the tests that the devil brought to him. Satan comes to me, Jesus said, but he has nothing in me. Jesus is laying there wounded. Y'all think God dispatched an angel all the way from glory to give Jesus a biscuit, huh? This thing was, was different. It was, it was greater than just a physical exhaustion. Yes. Jesus was wounded on the inside. And the, and the angels came and they began to minister to him. Hallelujah. It was a spiritual thing. We get weary in battle. I'm not talking about you want to backslide. Sometimes when, folks, when we tell folks we get weary in battle, they think we get ready to backslide. I don't mean I, I got some tests and some trials that that the enemy brings my way. I ain't even thinking about backsliding, but I am wounded by it. Yeah. Things that can happen in your family over which you have no control of it. And, and you praying and you seeking God, and you think just because you praying and seeking God, that insulates you from test and trial. No, sir. You can be wounded by the experiences of life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We need to go to God and when we've stumped our toe or we've bruised our elbow and, and tell God to kiss it anymore yeah. make it and make it all better. Yeah. That's why we come to church all the time. The world don't understand it. They say, why you folks got to come to church all the time? 
You know, it said your whole life is wrapped up in church. That's all y'all do is come to church. And I said, let me tell you something. When I was out in the world, that's all I did was go to work and on Friday get paid, buy me some clothes, get drunk, get high fornicate, do all of that, and then on Monday I get sober, go back and work some more, and come back on Friday, get drunk again, do that again. What are you talking about? That's all I do. Sure, that's all I do. That's all I want to do. This is the life. We thank God for you tuning in to the Christ Temple Apostolic Hour. This broadcast this was recorded in our facility at 14 South Ashland Avenue. We trust that this broadcast has been a blessing to you. Until next time, may God continue to richly bless you. Yeah! Yeah, this ain't about the natural. This is about the spirit, y'all. Hallelujah. Well, I want to talk to you a little while about being beat up, about being passed up, and about being picked up. Touch your neighbor and say, beat up, passed up, picked up. Oh, glory to God. Now, time restraints will not allow me to give an extensive background attention to the significance of the choice of Jericho for this practical illustration that I read to you. Suffice it to say that during the time when Jesus was living in Palestine, Jericho had a very bad reputation. It was, I'm told, the ancient red light district of the Holy Land, sort of a Las Vegas of the Holy Land. And if you were looking for a good time, you went down to Jericho. If you wanted, if you wanted to party, you went down to Jericho. And no self-respecting Jew would ever be caught down in Jericho. And so, my brothers and sisters, it is against the background of this information that Jesus tells a story that a certain man went down to Jericho. Well, brothers and sisters, I want you to know something today. Anytime you leave the confines of the church and go back into the world, you're going down and you will be wounded. I'm not, I'm not sure what his motivation for going down to Jericho was, but I do know this, saints of God, it was a high-risk situation. Some of us know that there are places that we ought not to be. There are situations and circumstances that we ought not to be. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I got the Holy Ghost. You ought not to be at the park <laughs> late at night. <laughs> Talking about I, the Holy Ghost will keep you. No, not in that high risk situation. It won't. It's a high risk situation. And the probability of you falling and failing God is very, very high. Yeah. Why are you going down to Jericho? You know what's down there. I'm going down there to witness. No, you're not. Talk about you in a den of thieves, my friend. You're on the devil's territory. His power is strong when you're on his territory. Thank God for the blood. And so this man goes down to Jericho. Possibly he was just looking for a good time. Hallelujah. But we do know that this man, as he approached the city, he was ambushed by a band of thieves. Well, saints of God, when you leave the protection of the church, you're exposing yourself to the powers of Satan. Satan's powers are strongest on his territory. And Satan's agents took his money and stripped him of his clothing and left him for dead. In fact, they thought he was dead. And there he lay, beat up, bleeding, body exposed to the elements with very little hope of deliverance, for remember, no self-respecting Jew would ever be found down in Jericho. But wait a minute, could this be? Are my eyes deceiving me? Here comes a priest, my brother, my spiritual guide, my doctor in the house. Surely help is on the way, but he was passed up. It and give it to me. I said, I don't need to see it. Throw it in the garbage can. I don't want to look. I know what's in there. I've been there before. God delivered me from that. I'm not going back with that. I'm not even exposing myself to that stuff no more. Because I want to be clean. I think God blesses us when we're clean. Oh, glory to God. So the priest passed him by, the religious folk. 
you know, Holy Ghost feel, five baptized, and I feel all right. Yeah, but we pass up our brother sometimes. And so, while I was wounded in agony, despondent and just waiting to die, hope again is raised because he sees a Levite across the road. Now, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. You know that, don't you? The Levites are the church members. <laughs> And the uh, priests are the ecclesiastical uh, ministers. And all of these folks had an obligation to help their brother. You have an obligation to help your brother. You have an obligation to help your brother. Hallelujah to God. The brother, brother said to me one time, he said, I know you're going through some financial uh, battles. And he said, uh, you know, uh, I would help this brother. Uh, and he was talking about another brother was having some problems. I said, I would help him. He said, but I'm, I'm waiting for the Spirit to tell me what to do. But the Bible says if you see your brother right. in need and you shut up your bowels of compassion, yeah. how dwelleth the love of God in you? But a certain Samaritan, he's not named for that's not important. The important thing is that he's a, he's a Samaritan. He, <laughs> and the Samaritans and the Jews, they don't have no dealings with each other. Y'all know that, don't you? That woman that was at the well, get all uppity and smart with Jesus, coming out of her little religious bag. Who are you uh, asking me, you being a Jew and me being a Samaritan, asking me for a cup of water? Don't you know we don't have no dealings with each other? Jesus said, honey, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was asking of you, you would have asked of me and I would have given unto you living water. You'd never have to drink again. They didn't have no dealings with each other. They didn't have no dealings with each other. And this, this Samaritan came where he was and picked him up, beat up by the world, passed up by the church, passed up by your brother. But this Samaritan who had no obligation, sometimes folks outside the church will help you more than folks in the church. He got what he deserved. What if God was to give you what you deserve? All right. Uh -huh. All right. And so I look at this passage of scripture and I think about that passage of scripture in the book of Ezekiel and it says the son of man, he says, calls Jerusalem to know her abomination. Thy birth and thy nativity is in the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, thy mother a Hittite. <laughs> you didn't come from aristocracy. You didn't come over on the Mayflower. Uh, you come from the most savage people around. Who you think you are? Just because God done cleaned you up. He says they threw you out. This is, the, this is one of those powerful abortion clauses. They threw you out into a field. Still with a neighbor cord wrapped around your neck. Blood all over you. And you would have died out there. You were beat up by the world. You were passed up. But then God came by one day and saw you out there polluted in your blood and God said, live! But God, who was rich in mercy, while we were yet sinners, Christ saved by Christ from death but many of us are still wounded and our wounds have to be washed our bandages have to be changed we must be taught to go another way it take a fool to go back down the Jericho road come on that's ain't nothing on the Jericho road but cutthroats and thieves and murderers it take a fool to go back down the Jericho road but that's what we have Folks are in my office all the time. Didn't I, didn't I see you in there last week? Two months ago, three months ago. Didn't I tell you to stay off that Jericho road? Didn't I tell you to stay off that road? Didn't I tell you to take the road less traveled? Didn't I tell you to stay off of Broadway? The Bible even speaks of Broadway. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Stay off of it. I preached a message uh, last year called Clean to Get Dirty Again. 
Some of us come to God and ask God to wipe our plate clean and God wipes it clean of all the sin and, and all the stuff that's on our plate. And then we say, we're clean, we can, we can get dirty now. And we go back and this, this is grace abuse. Hallelujah to God. But I believe that the end that the wounded man was brought to was the church. And Jesus placed our soul's medical insurance policy uh, in the church. Ooh, glory to God. He purchased our salvation with his blood. Hallelujah to God. He, pray, he paid the premiums on our insurance. And the thing I like about it is some of y'all had pre-existing conditions. And you know insurance companies won't take you if you got a pre-existing condition. Some of us had pre-existing conditions of fornication and adultery and, 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 and lying and stealing. But God still paid the angels premiums for us. And loved us back to life. He didn't shame us back to life or guilt us back to life. But God gave us love compression. Yeah, he didn't give you CPR. He gave you some L. He just gave you some love compressions. You were dying, and God said it was a time for love. Oh, glory. Got it. Got it. The Veteran Administration was created to let the world know that the United States takes care of its wounded. And if you don't take care of your wounded, you'll never get other folks in another war to fight. If you don't take care of your wounded, you won't get, in future wars, you won't get soldiers to fight. And I want you to know that Jesus cares for the wounded of his church. The church is God's VA. And we take care of the wounded in the church. Too many of these churches are abdicating their responsibility. They're turning the treatment of their wounded over into the hands of secular systems. But you need to know this morning that this is a healing place. And Jeremiah's question is a legitimate question. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Is there no doctor in the house? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? It's a legitimate question. I think it's a legitimate question. Why with all of this power of the Holy Ghost available at our disposal, why are we not fully recovered from our wounds? Why are we always testifying all the time, but we don't see the power of God in our services? Uh, if you don't have a good transmission, uh, you're not going anywhere. Why are we always talking about what God's going to do, and God's not doing nothing? It's because of us. It's because we carry these wounds around with us. Year in and year out. I'm saved. I didn't say that. It's not a question of salvation. I know you're saved. I know you've been baptized. It's that stuff you've been carrying around with you. It's that bitterness that you've been carrying around with you. It's those pockets of lust and carnality that you've been... It's that resentment to leadership that you've been carrying around with you for so long. You think that's not going to send you down to the lake, but it will! And your past keeps controlling your future. You're stuck in your past. You've grown emotionally, and you've grown physically, and you've grown intellectually, and you've grown financially, but you're stuck. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. You're stuck. Hallelujah. And you, you got saved. But you never dealt with that pain that was on the inside. You never brought that to God. And you carry that around with you. And it comes out from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. If folks is having problems at home, you just give them a few weeks. They're going to manifest themselves in the church. Right. Folks right. are having problems in church because they're having problems at home. Yeah, they're having problems on the job. There's stuff that they haven't dealt with. It's still, and it bursts out from time to time. Oh, I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. It was in you. That's right. Born in an orphanage. Born in a hospital. And within 24 hours, they tell me I was put in an orphanage. Glory to God. I said my mother had a nervous breakdown the very day that I was born. My brothers tell me afterwards, they said, 
the problem was, Mike, that mom took one look at you, and you were so ugly that she cracked up. Now, you know, I can laugh about that now, but that's what really hurt me. And they took me from that place and put me into an orphanage. And I stayed there for four or five years and experienced abuse on a number of different levels. And even after I came back out, I never was able to fully integrate with the rest of the family. All of them are light skinned, pretty hair. Yes, shut up, ocean. And they call me blackie and ugly. Oh, that stuff hurts. Yes. So I know physical abuse. I know sexual abuse. I know emotional abuse. And then I came to Jesus. All right. Here it comes. And I got baptized in the name of Jesus. And God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I know I spoke in tongues. But I was still wounded. I still carry around that wounds with me. And I did not allow God to touch it. And it came out from time to time, too. What's in you will come out. I'm trying, I'm trying to shorten this thing. It came out from time to time. God gave me that revelation of me one day. I said, God, I want to know me. I want to know not what the That's folks it. think about me. Uh, not, the, not the academic me. Hallelujah to God. Not the professional me, not the, the first black chaplain of the police department, uh, not the executive director of the narcotic task force, not the, the recipient of the highest FBI award in the nation, not that me, that's the public me. I want to know me on the inside of me. I want to know the black stuff. I want to know who I am, why it is that I do what I do. I want you to tell me about it, Lord. You say, take it away. Y'all sing the song of the prophet. Take it away from me. <laughs> I don't want the Lord to take it away from me. If he takes it away from me and he don't tell I me why it is that I did what I did, I get forgiven, but I don't get insight. I want God to give me insight and revelation as to who I am and why it is that I do what I do and why I think like I think. Then after he tells me that, then I want to lift it up to him and say, it's ugly, it's dark, it's black, and I bring it to you, God, because I've been wounded. I'm closing now. Hallelujah. Can you imagine a woman that's been demon-possessed? Can you imagine the condemnation, the depression, the mental anguish caused by all of these demons that were living inside of this woman? Understand, my friends, Mary was not demon-oppressed. I think a lot of saints are demon-oppressed. I'm, I'm just a little leery about saying the demons living inside of the Holy Ghost and all that. You know, I think that he oppresses a lot of people. But this woman, these were the demons lived at. That was their address. That's when they gave out the address, they said, 126 Mary Magdalene Road is where I live. I live on the inside. And we may leave. They may leave to go out and do some work. You know, demons have to work too. They go out and do work and everything. But they know at the end of the day, when they're arrested and they need some rest, they come back to Mary Magdalene's house. And they come into that woman. Demons come into her. And God delivers this woman from all of those guys. I want you to know that it's not enough just to be delivered. It's not enough just to be delivered. God has to tell you some things. God has to reveal some things. There's a lot of folks that have been delivered, but they don't really know who Jesus is. They don't look at Jesus the right way. And most of the time when Jesus healed somebody, he sent them back home. But he sensed in Mary the need to be taught. And he let Mary hang with him. Most of the time he sent her back home. And Mary 
went to the bank, got everything out of the bank, her and some other women, and they personally became responsible for the financial upkeep of the Jesus Christ. You read your Bible, you'll find this in the Bible. And so Mary, she's delivered from all of these demons that were in her, and yet, and yet she still is dependent upon the man in Christ Jesus. And that can be dangerous when you ever become too close and dependent upon a man. There's so many people that come in my office and, and, and they transfer their hurt and their, and their feeling of inadequacies to me and think, I, I can't take care of your needs, sweetheart. <laughs> uh -uh, God didn't send me there to do that. He didn't send me there to become a part of the problem, my friend. Uh, well, a young lady looked at me one time when I was counseling and she said, she said, if only I would have a man like you. No, no, no. You can't have me. I, I've got somebody already. Hallelujah. But a lot of times we become too close to man. Hallelujah to God. And Jesus has some unfinished business. Isn't it interesting to you and to me also that when Jesus reappears, the first person that he appears to is a woman. <laughs> All right. And a form of demonic. All right. And he appears to this woman, and here is Mary, timid, squeaky, can't, even, can't assert herself, just weak and vacillating Mary before Jesus met. But something happened when the power of God comes into your life. And Mary's here at the tomb, and she looks down and she sees those angels, and they said, what you looking for? He said, I'm looking for Jesus. I said, what I'm looking for? And they said, he's not here. She's inquiring more. And then behind her, she hears this voice. She turns around, and the man behind her said, what you looking for? And she looked at him and thought he was a gardener. Now, this is not a woman's place to talk to a man like this in the Jewish Old Testament system. But she gets bold. She said, listen, you tell me where you put my Lord. If you have borne him thus, you tell me, because I'll go get him myself. And I'll bring him back here. And Jesus was so impressed with what, what had happened in her spirit. And Jesus said, Mary. And it wasn't the face of Jesus. It was the voice of Jesus. And there's something about when he calls your name. I know the difference when God calls my name. Thousands of people can call me, but when God calls my name. Michael. I was down, I was dirty, I was undone, but he called my name. He said, Michael, after you have, oh, glory to God, after you've suffered a while, I said, I'm going to strengthen you. And then he said, you're going to be a blessing to my people. Hallelujah to God. He says, and after you are, after you, after you are converted, he says, I want you to strengthen the brethren. He called my name. Mary, when he called, when he called Mary's name, Mary reached out in that human affection and tried to reach him with that human Jesus. Said, Look, the relationship is over. I'm no longer Jesus the prophet Rabboni. Look what she calls him, Rabboni, master. He's more than just a master. He's the Lord from glory. He's your God. He said, don't touch me. Don't touch me that way again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. Altar call. The adversary wants to keep us in bondage. He wants you to remain wounded. Because if you can spend the rest of your days licking your wounds, you can never truly help anybody else. We cannot minister to others until we've been healed. Too many of us are trying to work through our pain by reaching out to others who are in similar pain. And your desire is admirable, but you cannot effectively minister while you're still wounded. We got churches that are filled with preachers trying desperately to minister to wounded saints and they're wounded themselves. Have you ever been on a plane when they give the instructions about in case they have a problem and the oxygen mask falls down, they say, what they tell you first? Put it on yourself first. Before you try to render aid to somebody, put it on yourself. 
Well, we're in the military. Remember, they, they told you that when, you get, when they holler gas, you put that gas, man. Put your mask on first. Clear your mask. Then you can aid your brother and put it on there. There's a lot of us trying to aid folks and help people, and we're wounded ourselves. But there is a doctor in the house. And his name is Jesus. And God told me to tell you this morning, let the healing begin. Touch your neighbor and say, let the healing begin. Touch your neighbor on the other side and say, let the healing begin. Some of your wounds were small at first, but they had gotten so large because you never attended to those wounds. Did you not know that a small wound can kill you? I tell this and I sit there and I'm I almost died from a hangnail. You didn't think that. You can't die from a hangnail, can you? Saw a little piece there hanging there, and I took it one day, and I bit it off. Didn't think no more about it. Praise this holy. That's all right. That's all right, bring up. And all of a sudden, I looked on my finger, and there was a little red line right there. I didn't pay no attention to it. I went about a week or two, and that line had gotten to about right here. I still didn't pay any attention to it. One day I was working in the detention center with severely criminal young people, murderers and what have you. And the nurse, we were in eating lunch and the nurse was in the place and she said, Michael, what is that line? I said, what line? She said, that line that leads from your finger, it was right here on my arm right here. She said, that doesn't look right. She said, why don't you go and ask the doctor to check that out. And the doctor asked me to go to the hospital immediately. He says, there's a blood clot that's trying to make its way to your heart. It was just a little wound at first. But I didn't take care of it. I didn't treat it. I didn't bandage it. I didn't pay attention to it. And I believe little wounds that are in the church are spreading to the heart of the people of God. Hallelujah little stuff that we allowed to fester for years little anger little bitterness my sister told me one time my baby sister said see that girl over there i said yeah she says i don't like her she said i haven't liked her for we we haven't spoke since uh the 10th grade i said what she do valerie she said i can't remember but i don't like her The Hatfields and the McCoy were fruiting for years. You remember on Andy Griffith, they got them together and asked them, what y'all been fruiting about? They said, I don't know. They said, my mama told me that we don't like the Hatfields. We don't like the McCoy. Stuff that we don't even, don't even mount to a hill of beans. And the Bible says, why don't you rather take the wrong? Why don't you rather suffer the indignities and let God work it out for you? God wants to heal some folks in here this morning. God wants to heal. God, there's a doctor in the house. There's a doctor in the house. His name is Jesus. He died for our sins. He, died. he not only died for our sins, but he died for the wounds that we carry around with us. Bitterness on our face. God can take all of that out of your spirit right now. Come on, everyone, stand to your feet right now. We're going to ask God to do something in here. We're going to ask God to move in this place right now. Hallelujah to God going to ask you to step out from your somebody needs God right now somebody needs to touch God right now and ask God say God heal these wounds somebody even may even need to stand in proxy for somebody else you're struggling with something don't hold that thing on the inside God wants to do something for you come on let God do something for you this morning the presence of God is in this place God's presence is in this place let God do something for you this morning God move in this place right now move in this place right now heal the brokenhearted why is not the wounds of my daughters healed God do something for those folk that are over here right now and God do it for them right now in the name of Jesus Christ let God minister to you right now wounded soldiers you don't have to walk around wounded anymore because there is a doctor in the house God bless you Is there one more will come? One more will you come? Is there another one?